time, let's do a, a brief uh, round of introductions. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Raina Fox. I'm the Partnerships Director at Millennium Campus Network, and I'm gonna give a brief intro after we finish this round of introductions. Um, Amanda, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so my name is Amanda Ripple. Um, I'm interning this summer with MCN um, and functioning as the, the campaigns coordinator, so that's kind of how I fit into to this process. Um, but I'm a student at Kansas State University, um, and I'm happy to be here this summer, so. Great, um, Sam, can you introduce yourself? Um, well, hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, so my name is Sam Vagar, I'm the executive director here at MCN, really focused on convening and training this next generation of social impact leaders and uh, yeah, just it, this is a phenomenally exciting opportunity. So uh, we're thrilled about this partnership and really excited that, that you're all with us. Great, thank you. Um, Yulia, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Yulia. Uh, I'm an international relations student at NYU, and I'm director of program interns with MCN. Um, Pedersen and Emanuelson, can you introduce yourselves? Hello everyone, I'm Pedersen Bernard. I'm the co-winner of the Ocean Prize in 2016. And I am the manager, the co-manager of the Clean Street, Clean Stay campaign. And with me? I am Emanuelson Bernard. I am the co-winner of the 2016 Ocean Prize Millennium Campus Ocean Prize, and I am the co-manager of this project in Street Clean e with Pedrisen. As a sociologist, um, my task is uh, always on the field. Like I always meet people, I'm meeting with them. That's the reason why sometimes I'm not in the meetings with Pedrisen. So it is a pleasure for me to be here, and I hope that we're going to have a super great conversation. Excellent, thank you. Um, Michael, I see that there's, uh, there's someone with the name Michael's iPhone. Um, can you introduce yourself? Oh, and maybe Michael's just listening in, so I'll come back to you. Um, and Sarah, can you briefly introduce yourself? And actually, before you do that, um, just a note to everybody, if you can keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking, that will help us to not have feedback. So you mute yourself by just pressing the picture of the microphone in the bottom left of Zoom. So Sarah, would you like to briefly just introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sarah Mesnick, and I'm an ecologist at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, which is part of NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I'm here in San Diego. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Sarah is one of our speakers, so we will be hearing more from her momentarily. Um, and Allison, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Hammer. I'm also with NOAA, but I am based in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I work for the Office of Habitat Conservation. I focus on partnerships and communications. Wonderful. Thank you. And Allison is our other speaker from NOAA today, so you will also hear more from her. Um, so continuing my way around the screen, Wendy, can you briefly introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Wendy Chen. I'm a sociology major at Mount Holyoke College, and this summer I'm the director of storytelling intern at MCN. Uh, very happy to join the call today. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. And Karina, maybe you can reintroduce yourself now that we've got a few more folks on. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Karina. I live in New Jersey, but I'm a junior at the University of New Haven in Connecticut. Uh, I'm a marine biology major, and I have a double minor in psychology and political science, so I'm excited to be here. Great, welcome. And Steve, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Steve Fox. Um, and I sit on the board of the Rimmer Family Foundation. Uh, we're the funder of the prize. I'm pretty pumped to see my buddies, the Bernard brothers here and winners of the prize last year and all these great folks at the MCN, Noah, and all of you uh, signing in today. Excited for this conversation. Great. Um, and I see uh, there's somebody who's listed as NEAQ, Zoom One. Um, I'm not sure who that is, but if you can briefly introduce yourself. Hey, sorry. Yeah, this is Brian Helm of at Northeastern University. Um, hey, 
Uh, sorry, I was at the New England Aquarium, and I must have them. Um, I am the Environmental Studies Director at Northeastern University, um, and so I'm listening in on behalf of my students, and I also serve as one of Fabian Cousteau's science advisors. Nice to meet you, Brian. <laughs> Excellent. So happy to have you here, and we're looking forward to meeting you in person soon. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, great. Um, Sophie Elizabeth Kennedy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a junior at NYU studying environmental studies and anthropology, and I do coral reproduction, recruitment, and restoration work in Bermuda. Great, thank you. And last but not least, John, can you introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Cody. Um, I'm a recent grad of Columbia University, also a former Millennium Fellow. Um, and I'm the executive director of uh, the first National First Generation Low Income Partnership. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Excellent, thank you. And I'll, I'll give one more chance to the person listed as Michael's iPhone. Um, and if Michael, if you have the ability to speak, we'd love to hear an intro from you. Okay, great. In that case, I think we're ready to dive in. So welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you on this call. Um, we are just so excited about the opportunity that this Oceans Prize presents. Um, and I'm going to begin by just giving you a little intro to MCN and also to how this hour is gonna go. So I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see what I am going to present. Uh, let's see here. All right, and if there's anyone new who joins, um, if you can just add your information to the chat um, so that everyone on the call gets to know who you are, that would be great. So great, so today what we're going to be doing is in part one, having a discussion about why oceans. Um, and we'll begin with two presentations. One is from Dr. Sarah Mesnick, um, and the other is from Allison Hammer, and you just heard their introductions very briefly, but we're really looking forward to hearing more from them. And then there will be some time for an open conversation. Um, so any of you who are on the call, we invite you to ask questions, add comments. This is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about some of the cutting edge work happening in the ocean space. Um, and just a reminder that if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute so that we don't have feedback in the background. Um, and then in part two, we're going to transition to talking more specifically about the Oceans Prize. Um, so we have our funder, Steve Fox, or a representative of the Remmer Family Foundation, which is funding the prize on the call. So he'll be talking a little bit about the prize, and then we'll be hearing from um, some of our past winners, uh, Pedersen and Emanuelson Bernard, and also potentially Casey Brayton, who was the runner up the year before. Um, and then we'll have some open space for conversation and questions about the prize itself. Um, so to begin with, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about MCN. So Millennium Campus Network is a nonprofit based in Boston, but we work with students all over the world. And when I say all over the world, I really do mean that. We have students um, leading on their campuses in Haiti, in Liberia, in Pakistan, in England, all over. Um, but what unites the students is that they are all working to advance the sustainable development goals. So this is a list of 17 goals that the United Nations agreed on, um, things that we really need to be working on to allow for a, a more sustainable planet. Um, and our goal as MCN is to unite students across different issue areas. Often people are doing this work in silos, uh, maybe just working on education, but they don't necessarily get to connect with people working on climate change. Um, and also across institutions and countries and to help students be more ethical, effective and engaged in that work. Um, so we have an annual conference, um, which this year will be our ninth one. We will be in Morocco, which is very exciting. Um, and you are all invited. And we also have a fellowship that takes place during the, the school year. Um, and our third program is our campaigns. Um, so that's where we all come to this conversation today. Um, so the campaigns are an opportunity for students to really lead the conversation. Um, we are asking you to decide what should young be people be doing to really rally around the SDGs that, that you care about the most. Um, so this will be our third year of having student-led campaigns. 
Um, and one of those campaigns is the Oceans Campaign. Um, so that's SDG number 14, as you can see on this screen. Um, and we have had two past campaigns. Um, in 2015, the winner was 10 by 2020, um, which was a campaign really focused on educating young people about the importance of working towards oceans conservation. So they held monthly webinars talking about big picture questions, um, things like why should we have sustainable seas, what is the crisis of fisheries, et cetera. Um, and they also had a lot of speakers come in and share opportunities for students to tap into existing um, campaigns and opportunities for action. And this year, our campaign winners are Emanuelson and Pedersen Bernard, who are leading Clean Street, Clean Sea, an initiative in their community in Carrefour, Haiti. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, so I just wanted to give you that brief introduction before we dive in, um, so in this first uh, component of our call, we're going to be talking, uh, and then I'll come back to this later, specifically talking about the deadlines and the, the process for the Oceans Prize for this year, um, because we're now recruiting for our third, um, our third prize winners. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to be turning it over first to Sarah and then to Allison to share a little bit about their story. Um, why is it that they care about the oceans? What are they doing? And why should we as young people be rallying around the oceans and fish issues? Um, so first I'll turn it over to Sarah and then Allison, and then we'll have some open time for conversation. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Hi everyone. Um, thank you to, Am um, to Amanda and Raina for inviting me and it's really an honor to be involved in this project. I didn't know about it until last week and I'm really impressed with the Millennium Campus Network and I hope that um, through this presentation and future ones that we can stay involved and invite all of the folks on the call that are interested in oceans to get involved with NOAA um, through internships and other ways that students can get involved. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen, I hope, and tell you a little bit about myself, how I got involved in oceans, uh, why I think oceans are important, and I'm gonna end with a couple of my thoughts for you of where we really need young people, the questions that I think are challenges for the next decades moving forward. So let me try to share my screen. And there we go. So can you see my, uh, this is where I really like to be. I'm out at sea in the Gulf of California and Mexico and I'm studying sperm whales. I'm an ecologist at the Southwest Fishery Science Center. I'm a marine mammologist, and I study um, sociality at sea. I study marine mammals and their social relationships and how we can better use this understanding of the social lives of high, highly intelligent, long-lived, large-brained animals. The more we know about them, the better we are able to do conservation and management. And that's the goals of the NOAA Fisheries Service, where I work, is to recover marine mammals. Um, but we do this in a larger context of marine fisheries. And so looking at how we can conserve species that we care about, but also at the same time, be able to have sustainable seafood because people like to eat seafood and we need that protein. So how we combine this interest in conservation but sustainable use is the goal of NOAA Fisheries. Um, I did not come to my present position here um, in my office where I am both an ecologist as well as lead our communications work at the center. I did not come here in a straight line and that's one of the things that I think is really important for students to realize that you probably have a lot of strengths just coming into your life right now, things that you know from your family or your hobbies that will help shape your career and to understand that we don't all know what we want to do from the beginning is a shared um, uh, situation for all of us. So um, I, a while I was hired to work on genetics of sperm whales, um, this next slide will show you, let me make sure I know how to get to the next slide. There we go. This is what I'm currently working on. This is the world's most endangered marine mammal, the vaquita. 
it also lives in Mexico in the Gulf of California. And it's a beautiful animal. It's about as tall as most of us on the phone. It's a little over five feet tall. It weighs about 120 pounds. And it has always been a small population in the far northern Gulf of California. This animal is, um, uh, getting to my next slide, hold on, hold on, there we go. There, the um, population um, estimates were never high, but as you can see from the graph on the left, the population has declined by 95%. We're down to 30 individuals. This really is looking extinction in the face. This animal will be gone in a year or two or three or just a few years if we do not eliminate gill nets. And the picture on the right shows one of these porpoises wrapped in a gill net. And they are not intentionally wrapped in gill nets. These gill nets are set for shrimp and fish which feed both the local communities, but also are exported around the world. It's some of the world's most valuable um, shrimp, for instance. So the animals are accidentally killed in these gill nets. And what we need to do is find a way for fishermen to fish and not to use gill nets. And that's been the role that our center, uh, working with an international group of scientists through the government of Mexico, has been trying to solve. Let me get to my next slide. So my point to you is that one of the greatest threats uh, facing the ocean today is actually our dinner. The oceans need to feed a billion people. And we need to figure out ways that that can be done so that it's both feeding and sustaining the world's populations, but not hurting the oceans themselves. And the way I'd like to say this sometimes is we ate our way into the problem, and we need you all to help us eat our way out. Find a way to be able to provide good, clean, healthy protein for the world's populations, but at the same time, conserve our natural resources. Um, the way we find solutions to that is not what it used to be. Um, we as scientists typically think that science will solve everything and what I've learned over time is that that is certainly not true. We need to involve everyone along the seafood supply chain. So the top left here shows me as a scientist and the three pictures on the, the two pictures on the right and on the bottom here show me now. Um, I work all the way from ocean to table. I work with fishermen and local communities. I work with chefs. I also work with artists and writers and videographers to engage the entire supply chain in finding solutions to our problems. And what you can see are fishermen developing new types of gear, us bringing those products to chefs, chefs figuring out ways to uh, cook them and use their own social networks to tell people about how you can save the oceans by knowing what you're eating. So in closing, I just wanted to say three things. Um, the first is that I think some of our best innovations come from unusual collaborations. And this may mean in yourself, with your past, with your grandmother in the kitchen, with the parts of you that you may not um, feel are your career choices that make you special, the, whether you speak a, another language or you have people in your lives that give you a different perspective, that makes you really special. And you should um, make sure that you don't discount your own strengths. The second is that collaboration is going outside your box, um, talking to people in other fields. That is where I think the most um, creative innovation comes from. The second point here is that um, for a long time, conservation and economics were separated. I think to save the world's oceans, we need to look at sustainable seafood, sustainable oceans, and sustainable communities. And that means um, the folks I heard on the phone that have double majors in things like science and politics or science and sociology, you're really on the right track, that it's people that are going to save the oceans. And the last is um, a lot of our food comes from wild capture fisheries, but more and more comes from aquaculture. 
and we need your help in defining the future of aquaculture. And I think that's a really big area that's growing and needs creative thinking. So with that, um, thanks very much and happy to later take any questions. Amazing, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I know there will be many questions, but for now, um, once you've stopped sharing your screen, maybe we can turn it over to Allison. Hi. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. So I'm Allison Hammer. I also am going to share my screen, but I want to first thank you all for inviting me to be here today. It's very exciting to be with all these students and um, also Sarah with my other NOAA colleague to, to meet you this way. I'm based in Silver Spring, Maryland. So um, I am on the other coast from Sarah, so I haven't met her in person, so this is great, and I really enjoyed learning about your work. Uh, NOAA is a very large agency uh, where the United States um, federal agency that focuses on oceans, oceans conservation, fisheries, uh, as well as the weather, so we're very diverse. And um, I've been with NOAA, NOAA for about 20 years. I can't believe it. It feels like... Um, was yesterday, but I, I was in the National Ocean Service part of NOAA for most of my career until just recently I moved to the fisheries part focusing on habitat conservation. So I'm going to um, share my screen here and give a presentation um, from the habitat conservation side of, of the house, And um, but it's all connected and that's my big point to you all today, you know, and I think most of the, all of Sarah's points are right on with a the people are going to be the solution, and so it's very exciting to have you all um, thinking about this, um, and it's not just the folks in the government thinking about it. So let me try to figure out how I do this. I'm going to pull up my um, desktop here and hopefully get my PowerPoint up. Um, no, that's not my PowerPoint, so bear with me. Sorry, guys. PowerPoint. Okay. And... Can you guys see my my PowerPoint or not? Nope. So you'll have to click on at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, uh -huh. So go back to where the video is. If you uh -huh. hover, if you hover, you will notice there's a green box that says Share Screen. So you'll have to okay. click on that. Yep, I clicked on that. But on the next one, you have to click on the Share Screen again at the bottom of that next box. There okay. we go. There, there we go. go. Okay, let me yep. pull up the PowerPoint. Thank Great. you for the, the double click. <laughs> More time sensitive. So I'm just going to really talk. Can you see my screen now? I hope. Okay. Yes. Um, so this is just going to be a little bit about what my office does specifically. So um, you can read the, the description, but we're really about the habitat that uh, protecting and restoring habitat to sustain fisheries recover the protective resources that Sarah was talking about, and then also maintaining resilient ecosystems and communities. So those are the three main areas we focus on, and some of those goals are here with, um, we conserve habitat for the fisheries and protective resources, and then we also restore habitats from um, being impacted from something like deep water horizon, so oil spills or other hazardous substances releases, and then we work with communities to make them more, um, you know, it's that balance between people and the habitat. So really working to, you know, help make a community more safe for flooding yeah, or something along those lines. Um, Allison, sorry to interrupt, but we actually, I don't think we can see your PowerPoint. I wonder if oh, you're, you're the... just looking at my email probably. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hold on. Let's see if I can close that without closing you. Can you see 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 this now? Well, now we oh. see you, which is also great. All right. so. I'm sorry. I, was, I can just keep talking. Does this that sounds good? <laughs> Perfect. Thank can, you. Can you see this? My screen here? No. No. All right. So share screen, and I'm gonna click on the PowerPoint and say share screen. How about that? There we go. Perfect. Hey, now we see it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you were just watching my face uh, before. All right. So starting over. So this is where uh, I was just talking about the mission of the office and our goals are really focusing on improving and protecting and restoring habitat for the fisheries and the, the critters in the ocean and communities. 
And we really do this from protection to restoration, um, and we do it through sound science, as well as partnerships. Everything we do is through partnerships, so, so the people component are very important. And um, habitats are critical to the coastal economy, so it helps with the shoreline eros erosion, flood control, clean water, and um, you know recreation and tourism. So these are all important reasons for for um, pr protecting habitat. And and so I'm just going to show you a couple highlights. I won't get into any details here, but just throughout the, the country about the different types of projects we work on. So this this one here is in Oregon, and it's restoring estuary for fish, but also reducing the flooding for farmers. And so um, we worked to prevent these, uh, you know, this the situation where the, the houses are being flooded by working on the, with the community to, to restore um, this area so that the flooding um, doesn't impact the farm. So, so that, that helps fish salmon out there as well. We also, this, is in, this situation is in Florida and it's re restoring the tidal flow for fish, it, which also increases recreation for people. So um, this is one in New Jersey where it's recovering from an oil spill and that's providing the harsh marsh habitat for birds. So, so um, there's a real diversity to this type of work. And then this one's in the Chesapeake Bay. So really focusing on oysters and supporting baywide efforts. So working with um, this oyster recovery partnership and, um, and the oysters there. But, but um, so, so those are kind of the habitat conservation, uh, you know, different types of things we focus on in my office. But I also want to just back up to, to the area, you know, you guys are interested in and, and my experience here at NOAA. As I mentioned, I, I was in the National Ocean Service part of NOAA before. And we're a big bureaucracy and, um, you know, big group. So it's a little confusing to figure out how, how we're organized. But in the Ocean Service part, we, you know, have very similar missions and I was most recently in the marine debris program which focuses on also on balancing you know the, the people side with nature so marine debris is really a lot about trash in the ocean and preventing it so kind of getting into last year's um, uh, highlighted prize that in Haiti so so really you know that's that's a lot about this prevention changing behaviors and raising awareness of people will help both the ocean and the coast and I think that balance so it's, it's a little different than the seafood angle but you know it, it's more the use of the the lands it's also the use of the land and um, marine debris you know and plastics in the ocean are a huge issue right now and that's something we know has been working with the United Nations environmental program on and there's going to be um, a big marine debris conference next year in 2018. So, so I think that's another area um, for me that is a real challenge. How do we prevent um, the, the things like the single-use containers and bot water bottles and things that are so convenient for humans? How do we prevent that from getting into the ocean and, you know, focusing on changing that behavior by raising awareness, I think is a big part of that. So once once folks are aware, so many of these things are connected. And I think that's the real part to, to think about are these connections between people and the environment and that we can't do it alone and it's all, you know, connected. So that's that's really my message today. Um, and you know, my final slide here is just focusing on the, that partnerships and community engagement are critical, as Sarah mentioned, and, and just that coastal habitats are the foundation for the, the fisheries. So, so these are all that big connection. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so if you can just unshare your screen. Um, yes, I will. I will try that as best I can. <laughs> Stop there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. So now um, let's open it up to anyone who has questions. This is a great opportunity for students to now speak directly to some of our 
most incredible leaders who are, are really thinking deeply about oceans and coastal ecosystems um, and thinking about what could you be doing to engage your peers around some of these important issues. So I'm gonna open it up to anyone who has a question and you can either just unmute yourself. Um, you'll notice that I muted most of you just to keep the feedback a little cleaner. Um, so you can either unmute yourself and ask or if you want, you can raise your hand um, and I will call on you. So with that, I will open up the floor. Kar Karina. I have a question for one of the students. Oh, can, we, can we reverse? Um, sure. Uh, I saw that Karina has a okay. question too, yeah. but it, maybe yeah, we can take hers first and then, and then ask. Yeah? Okay, great. So Karina, go ahead. Uh, I just, it's, I guess it's less of a question and more just a point that uh, both Sarah and Allison brought up, the um, involving people and the conservation and community. So I guess more so, I try to focus, I had an internship um, this past semester working on saving Plum Island, which I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with, but it's basically this island that the government's trying to sell. So do you think there's a lot of room for sustainable communities in that sense, not just really with fisheries, but kind of bringing people together and showing them what we could use things for to better the community as human beings and as the animals that live there? Um, uh, yes, I definitely think so. I mean, I think, um, we are uh, representatives from NOAA Fisheries, so that's our perspective, but for sure, you know, there's a lot to do with um, conserving land, um, land, and, and there's some of the NGO community get involved with that a lot, like the Nature Conservancy, and um, even, you know, some other parts of other agencies, but um, for sure, you could definitely get into the conservation of land is very, um, you know, it's very helpful and communities and engaged in that and raising awareness about that is really important. Thank you. Great. Other questions or comments? I know a lot of you are doing work. Um, even just in the chat, I've been messaging some of you and I know a lot of you are already doing fascinating work. So would any of our students like to share a bit about what they're doing or ask some questions of our guests? Well, I would uh, I would ask uh, a, a question to to, to Allison. Um, the project habitat conservation is concerning a specific way, a specific zone, or it is a global project? Because we are facing the same kind of problem in our in our coast in Haiti, because there are there are some um, fishery villages that were facing the same problem. So I would like to know if this project is concerns a, a specific way, a specific zone, or it is a global one. Um, sure, uh, it is, it's not, let me clarify that. That's a great question. So it, it's not a project, it's, it's a whole office. So we have about 120 people working on this mission and um, at NOAA. So it's, it's our national, you know, for, focusing mostly in the United States versus international, but that is, it's a program to, to focus on habitat restoration, conservation, and protection. And we do a lot of that through funding. It grants to different communities, groups um, apply for funding, as well as just working with them through something like um, the Deepwater Horizon response. So, um, so it's not a project, it's, it's more of a, um, you know, an office uh, in NOAA that has a bunch of people working on it. But we're not global either. So it's kind of a, a little bit different than either of those. I can add to that a little bit from the our perspective out in California. So like what Allison was saying, that around the world or around the country or wherever NOAA works, there's um, things projects that we work on. So for instance, we work on salmon in California. So it's a fish that breeds and lays its eggs in the rivers and then swims out to the ocean to live for a couple years and then comes back to the rivers. And one of the pictures Allison showed, showed that house where there was a lot of flooding. And so in the past, what the 
U.S. did was they put dams and they put cement in a lot of the rivers. And that prevented, enabled people to control the water, but it prevented the natural flow of water and that hurt the fish. And ultimately, it doesn't always control flooding. So what we have a program on salmon and there's salmon biologists, there's salmon ecologists, there's salmon eco economics, and there's all these projects to restore the habitat. So it's part of this bigger salmon restoration and it's on sites along the routes that the salmon take. Another example is we work on leatherback turtles and those turtles uh, feed in one part of the ocean and breed on islands like in Indonesia or in the Caribbean, not far from you. And the project to restore the leatherbacks, you also have to restore where they lay their eggs. So that means no lights on the beaches and where there's erosion, you have to rebuild the beach. So the, the habitat part is part of these larger projects on the particular species. Great. Um, any other questions from students? And if not, then Sarah, I know you have one too. So first, any questions from students? Sure. Uh, can y'all hear me? Sorry. Yeah, great. I'm, uh, I'm, in, I, I'm calling from Vietnam. I've been, uh, I'm, I'm, my name's Towns. I'm a sophomore at USC in Los Angeles. I've been working here in Vietnam uh, for a sustainable fish farm uh, in aquaculture, learning how it works. I'm a business student, uh, or at least that's how I applied at USC, but I uh, became interested in uh, corporate social responsibility and um, sustainable businesses. Um, so I came out here to learn how this business operates, and uh, I've really been enjoying it and, and, and was trying to find a way to kind of apply what I've learned here to my application for the Oceans Campaign. Uh, I'm just a little curious, you know, it, it looks like Hedgerson and Emanuelson's uh, campaign looks really cool, but it, it seems like it was more of a, a local deal. Uh, and then the 10 by 2020 deal was, was more global. Uh, I'm just kind of confused. What, what, what is, uh, is Millennium Campus looking for in applications? Is it a local uh, initiative, a global initiative, something for sustainable fisheries, sustainable water use? Um, regulating waste. I, I just, I, it seems like, you know, there are so many issues with how we use the ocean. Where uh, are, are you looking for uh, initiatives? That's a great, great question. And actually that perfectly um, will we'll transition into part two. So before we dive into that one, which we will hold, um, I see Sophie, you had a question. And if it's related to our, our speakers, maybe we can take that first. And that way our speakers can, de can decide if they want to stay on or if they want to bow out. So um, Sophie, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, my question kind of pertains to like a local test. For instance, a lot of communities get upset when you install conservation mechanisms. And I was wondering how you kind of educate them the benefits of it and whether, and like, I guess, whether or not you've had any cases of unhappiness. I can start to answer that question. And your question is, um, how do you work with communities so that you engage them, not like insult them by coming in and saying you think you know what they should be doing. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And that's a really, really good question. And I think that that's where a lot of conservation programs or projects, if they don't take that into mind, they're going to fail. And we, um, at NOAA, one of the things that Allison mentioned is partnership. And usually the best and most effective way is to partner with local people that are already thinking or are open to these ideas and doing collaborative research. So you heard um, Allison say her keyword was connections and minor collaborations, is that coming into a community, finding out what motivates that community first 
and then seeing who already is working on this. So we'll work with, for instance, partnering with a group of local women who are already doing conservation in their communities and then use that partnership. The other is collaborative research, and that's super powerful, is that inviting young people in from the communities to work on the projects with you, and that's a win-win because they connect you to the community and they learn um, the other skills and things that we may bring. So collaboration and partnerships. Yeah. Knowing the language is really important. You know, being able to speak to people and being open and uh, you know, having fun with local people too, being part of, trying to be as much a part of the community and bringing resources to it to get the community where it wants to go. And I have one more follow-up question that I just thought of when you were speaking. Um, so for, I'm from South Florida originally, and we had the whole Osborne Tire Reef. And so it's kind of a conservation method to build a reef and ended up to be a complete failure and if anything, costing the government significant amount of money and harming coral reefs and doing good. How do you kind of do the background research to really prevent these things and have assets to really kind of, um, I guess, use in case that were to happen? Yeah. I, um, I know of that project. <laughs> and, uh, one of my offices worked, at, or I think both offices I've worked in have helped to help to retro, you know, try to clean that up now. I, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of lessons um, that it's in a, the environmental field is changing and we're learning so much all the time. And just in, you know, my 20 years at NOAA, um, you know, people made decisions back then, or, you know, if you go back further in time, people think things are good ideas, but they, or they, even, you know, in health, in the health that uh, your doctors might tell you something about vitamins once and then they say, don't do that, you know, so it's, it's science, we have changed it, you know, we learn more and then we have to adapt. So those types of situations are challenging. If somebody thought that was a good idea, now we're cleaning it up, it wasn't that great of an idea. So I don't know that there's a real way to prevent that happening, you know, but I do think um, the research side of things is important. So, you know, investing in research and before starting to do something is important. Um, does that help? I don't know, that's a, that's a really tough project, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely helps. I guess I was just thinking like conservation versus kind of more um, preventative measures, um, but definitely that yeah. helps. Yeah, right. uh, and, and when it comes to things like that, yeah, you know, people even with, um, you see it with trash disposal, you know, putting it in a landfill in, in South Florida, you know, there, there's, the, what is it, Mount Trashmore is the highest point in South Florida, right? So, so then it's like, is that the best idea for what to do? Or maybe we should be composting more or something, you know, so some of that just changes with time and awareness and, and you know, science. Great. So I know this could be a, a much longer conversation. There's so much to dive into, um, but unfortunately, we we do ha we did promise we would we would end at one. So um, Allison and Sarah, thank you so so much for taking the time to speak with students. And if you're willing, perhaps you can put your information in the chat, and people can follow up with you. But it's totally up to you if if that's something that you would be willing to do. Um, and we, so thank you so much for joining us. And now let's actually transition um, to part two of our conversation, which is gonna be focused really specifically on the campaign itself. Um, and that hopefully will get to the question we just got as well. Um, so Sarah and Allison, you're welcome to stay on or get off whenever you'd like, <laughs> um, but thank you so much. Um, bye. Um, and so with that, um, I wonder if we can actually transition directly to you, Steve, to maybe share a little bit about the prize itself and kind of where, where it's coming from and what are the things that you're thinking about? Um, because ultimately this, uh, this campaign is, is really um, founded in, in our partnership with, with the Remmer Family Foundation. And I know this is something you care deeply about. So I'll turn it over to you and, and you can share a bit. Sure thing, Raina. Thank you again to Team MCN, Sarah and Allison, and I'll try to temper my usual craziness when it comes to talking about this issue for this call a little bit. I have been nerding out in a major way with questions galore about the Vaquita and your partnerships models. And, uh, and also, we didn't even talk about the Mideast Fluke uh, announcement that came out today. Everybody Google what's happening with Fluke in New Jersey so we can get a spirited debate going on. 
Um, but I want to quickly talk to you about why this issue is important to us, uh, why we choose the MCN to deliver the prize and its purpose. And I want to talk to you about what we're looking get to your question, talk to you about what we're looking for in a winner, although this uh, ultimately rests in the, the hands of the MCN. So uh, the Rummer Family Foundation um, uh, in our mission seeks to encourage environmental stewardship with a focus on improving the sustainability of the world's fisheries. This is a really important issue to us for a number of reasons. Fisheries are one of the world's most underfunded, complex, and far-reaching issues. Uh, the stewardship of the world's oceans will affect every single person on the globe and the sustainability of our planet. In particular, we focus on fish. Fish don't get any love. They're not sexy. Forgive if you do think so, I'm sorry. But they just don't get enough love. Um, but they affect food security and nutrition labor and incomes, particularly for vulnerable populations. They affect biodiversity, the health of our oceans, among a, a myriad of other issues. So, you know, in particular, like a couple of things we care about, and I, you know, our two previous presenters did a great job of showing the issues at hand, but there are 700 to 900 million people worldwide who depend on all or some part of their income from this sector. If you're keeping track, that's just over 10% of the world's population. So imagine if I took one in 10 of the people in your life and took away their source of income, like throw a little uh, uh, wrench in your day. Um, uh, there are 3 billion people for whom fish is a major source of protein and a billion for whom it is the source of protein uh, or the primary one. Uh, fish and marine life are 2 million of the world's 9 million species with insects being the other vast majority. Um, so sorry to the elephants and the jaguars, but fish are, you know, they've got you outdone. Don't mess with the fish. Um, and marine life keeps the ecosystem running. They're the recyclers, they're the food chain, they're everything. Um, so that's why we care about the issues and I could talk to you about it as MCN knows literally all. Um, but we chose the MCN um, to issue this prize because of um, all of the issues, but three in particular. One is getting young people passionate about, the, about this sector, about marine life, about the oceans and fish, might be the most important. Um, there's a part of it relates to climate change, um, part of it relates to the average age of the sector, which is really, really quite old. Um, doesn't matter if you're on the fishing side, the business side, um, or even the consumption side. Um, and, uh, and there are changing sector dynamics. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of consolidation happening in this space. Um, and uh, consumption habits have become really unsustainable. Uh, and we need to educate young people about uh, how they're using the ocean, what they're consuming out of it, um, et cetera. The second reason um, we want to, uh, to reach students is we want to reach students that are not interested in this issue. Um, the MCN gives a terrific opportunity for, for a prize winner, um, as Beatrison and Emanuelson can attest to, to speak in front of a whole lot of people who aren't passionate about this issue. And that is so important because for every vibrant young speaker who can talk about these types of things to people who don't know about them, we have a couple more converts or potential converts on the table. And that is a huge reason why the MCN is the perfect platform for this prize, is because they reach all the kids that I wanted to be when I was in high school and college, I was not one of those kids. I did a lot more of the stuff you're not supposed to do. But, I, but they're reaching those folks and turning them into advocates. And, and you know, they can, they can put this issue at the forefront. And the third reason is um, this is a team at the MCN that can take a fledgling idea and coach it into something sustainable. Um, you know, Piedrasen and Emanuelson had a pretty raw idea when we met them. I know our past prize winners can say the same types of things. And my God, uh, I'll let you, let you guys talk about it in a second, but they're crushing it in Haiti. Um, and, uh, and that is to their hard work and also with the help of, uh, of the MCN focusing on key performance indicators, et cetera. Um, so to get to your question, uh, what we're looking for in a winner is uh, we're looking for activists, we're looking for researchers, we're looking for uh, people in business, social entrepreneurs and, and elsewise. Um, and we've had people in each of those sectors um, who have kind of won the prize or been a runner-up. Um, we're not looking to fit a square peg into a round hole. We're not looking for folks who have a, an issue that is kind of tangentially related uh, to marine life or oceans and try to coach it into that. You know, uh, I don't think that 
uh, that draws the same level of inspiration as people who are really passionate about their issues. So if you're interested in applying for this, think about, um, you know, whether this is the right track for you. If not, the MCN has a million others that can help you out. Um, and we're looking at local and global. Um, I think for, for the Rummer Family Foundation, it's really about somebody who's passionate about this, about this idea, about this business, about the, this research, about the activism that they're doing um, that's related to this sector. And that broadness is there for a reason. We want to attract um, plenty of people who can apply for this prize from a, a myriad of sectors. So um, I hope that helps. Um, I will certainly leave my information for any questions you guys have of me. Uh, just be aware you're going to have to talk to me about like New Jersey fluke or, uh, or you're going to have to talk to me about the invasive lionfish in Haiti if we do talk. So, um, yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, so I'm thinking that, uh, so, so Pedersen and Emanuelson, I know we're kind of short on time, but maybe you could just give like a one to two minute, uh, summary of what you've been doing and that way we can make sure there's time for conversation. So do you think we can do that? Just a really brief intro? Oh, you're on mute. You'll have to unmute yourselves. Okay. 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 Great. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Again, we're very happy to be, here with, to be here with you this morning to, um, to make this little conversation about passion, about entrepreneurship, about youth in general, and this is why Clint, this is what Clint Street Clint is about. Um, I have planned to share some advices to the to the applicants of the of the Ocean Prize 2017. Um, I think we are just go with this people, and maybe after we will have a question session. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Um, it, it looks like it's black right now, but we can see it. Oh, there it is. Okay, we got it. Okay. Okay. So. It, yeah. it says questions conclusion. A minute, a minute, a minute. And in the meantime, I'm just going to point out while, while you figure that out, uh, if you look at the chat, um, Sam shared the link to the campaign's application um, and also a link to information about our conference, which will be taking place in November. Um, and there is also uh, Allison's email address, so you can take a look at that. And Sam, uh, Emmanuel. Okay, we have, planned, we have planned to share with people um, what we what we did so far in our campaign, but now we have to save the time, and I'm gonna we are gonna drop off um, directly into our experience working with MCN, and I'm gonna talk about some I'm gonna present some other But first, our experience with MCN, uh, working with MCN during this year, it was amazing because we had we had the opportunity to network network with leaders of leaders who are big ideas and who are tackling um, big issues in the world. And we had the opportunity to, to, to find mentor, mentor from MCN. We had, we had advice right. from Raina, from wow. Sam, from Steve. It is amazing. Okay. And you can develop yourself as a leader and you will organize how to make your organization and how to make your campaign a better campaign by organizing and MCN will allow you to become better leaders, better leaders for your society, for your community, for your country, and also mostly for the world. Now some advices for the applicant. First, you need to have an idea. By idea, I mean something innovative, okay? an idea that take into account people that take into account your community and your environment so be sure you put into account there's three facts people environment and your community so the second point you have to show passion for your idea so be committed to your idea show your love what you are doing show your concern about about 
the, the issue you want to tackle and tech globally. Um, for now, we can, we can see that Clean Street Clean City is working locally, but we have planned to extend our campaign impact to other countries. And for now, with our resources, we are working locally in order to make, in order to make the people um, live the benefits of our campaign. And further, we will have to extend it from, um, to other countries like Dominican Republic, Cuba, etc. You need to build up a team. That's the fourth print. You know it is a very important because it is a big task and you can make it alone. So surround yourself with great people, with great leaders like you, and we can we can we share the same passion as you. And the five the fifth print is get to work now. Um, because it will allow you to save a lot of time because if you, I, mean, I think the, the, the prize will be, will be presented officially during MC, MCC 17 right, and right. you got to get yourself to work immediately in order to save time and in order, in, in order to, to, to have a bigger impact in your community. And now, I don't know if we have, some some time we can take some questions and while you are talking about your question Emmanuelson will tell you what we did so far okay uh, we come from a community where waste is really present in our life so when it, the 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 weights flew to the ocean that caused a double problem on the earth and on the oceans that's the reason why Pedro and I have the the main clean street clean sea because we thought that if we clean street, they will have less waste in the sea. And it, and it will have a double effect on the earth and the, on the oceans. That's the reason why we, we, we organized this campaign. So since August 2016, from now, we have done many things. We, have, we had some expect, expectations, some pro projects, et cetera. So during this time, we have made presentation to over 200 of people. We have made some leaders. We, we had a Facebook page. We have some project that we plan to start. And we have defined some strategies. The first one were sensitization, and the second one was action. And the first point we had, we had so we had to get people sensitive to our campaign with a Facebook page, presentation, etc. And the sections we made the cleanup days. We 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 met some people who are, we who are living next to 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 the etc. So for the next coming up month, we plan to to have some project. Interesting and. Right. And to the programs we will have to launch in the next month. Um, there, there's our three programs: Class Eco. Class Eco is a program on sensitization. Um, we will organize ten sessions of in um, every department geographic of the country, um, and we are we are going to organize with the students. Um, we're going to create initiative, local initiative in every department where we have the presentation. And Kaipan Pop, which means my home is clean, it is a program of collect of trashes. Um, and it, it, it has also a part of sensitization where you, we will going to share tips and advice to, to, the, to our next cons customers about how they can manage their own waste better. And Zero Plastic Program, it is a program um, we have designed after visiting a coastal area of our community. And we have seen a lot of trashes for um, particularly plastic bottles. And we have talked with the people and together we come up with the idea to create a program that will fight the plastic in the sea and allow people to, to, to make money. So we have, we have already 
a, a partner for this firm and together we will work in order to impact the life of the population and to create together a better environment. So that's all for our presentation. If you have questions, we are open to answer. Thank you so much. So I know that we've suddenly made it to one o'clock, but if any of you would like to stay on um, and have additional questions, now is the opportunity to ask those. Um, so we can ask them to Steve, we can ask them to the, to the um, Bernard brothers, to us, um, and uh, Pedersen and Emanuelson, can you please stop sharing your screen? Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so, um, so if you have a question, you can either unmute yourself or raise your hand and I will call on you. Yulia, yes? Okay, <laughs> can you hear me okay? Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, at what stage should the, should the project be to be able to apply to for, for the price? Uh, does it have to be entirely developed and we're just ready to go or can it be an idea? Steve, would you like to take that? Yeah, I can take that. Um, yeah, it can be, you know, we're taking, uh, we'll take I I ideas and we'll take developed um, uh, programs as well. Um, I think having some background in the idea, um, like uh, I know, um, S uh, I think Sam shared um, the link to the prize, but, uh, but you should look at the kind of, the, the standards for the prize there. And there are a couple of things, a depth of knowledge would be useful. Um, hundred percent. I, I think you're going to be pretty lost, um, in the prize if you don't have some sort of depth of knowledge on the subject that you're speaking about, but we're certainly open to, um, to taking suggestions of, you know, a lot of the time students struggle with, they have a really cool idea, but they're lacking the funding, um, to really flush it out. And that's the prize is there for those types of students, certainly. And also for those, who have a developed program that they're already working on or project um, and the prize is there to uh, buttress that or uh, help it scale, take it to the next level. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? Oh, I see Olu is uh, raising his hand. So <laughs> great, uh, just go ahead. I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Okay. Good day, everyone. I just wanted to ask if it's compulsory or a requirement for you to, before you can win the, the prize, that you have to attend the MCC conference in, in October. Is, is that a requirement for you to win the prize, or could you win the prize otherwise? Let's say, for example, uh, academic uh, obligations doesn't make, makes it impossible to attend the conference. Could you still win the prize? Otherwise, yeah, that's my question. Yep, that's a great question. Um, and the answer is you do not have to attend the conference. Um, okay. So we certainly, oh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we certainly hope and encourage you to attend, but we know that that's not a possibility for everyone. So it is not a prerequisite that you attend the conference. Um, what you will be committing to is giving a presentation at the conference. So if you are not able to attend in person, that would happen via webinar, probably using a platform just like okay. this. So like yeah, so that would happen um, between November 16th and November 19th, which is when the conference is taking place. Mm -hmm. Great okay, In Morocco, right? In Morocco, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions like that? And, and if not, we'll, we'll run through the, the schedule briefly of, of the deadlines, as I know that's also a good question. Yes, Karina. Hi, um, I just have a quick question because one of the things I was thinking about uh, focusing my campaign on is Plum Island and conserving it. So I was wondering if that would be a problem because it's a little bit of a thing that's already out there. I mean, there's people already working on it, but I want to take a different angle and propose a different setup. So would that still be eligible as like an original campaign idea, even though it's already being worked on by people in the government and such?
Steve, would you like I to take that one? Go for yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, go at it. Take on Plum Island. Come on. Uh, we need multiple voices going after these things at once. I don't settle for a single, uh, single person or let a single body go after this. Kick Plum Island's ass. Or don't kick it. Protect its ass. <laughs> so, yeah, go. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> great question. Um, Sophie, do you have any questions? I want to make sure we, we have space for yours in case. Oh, I just have a quick question about um, if we don't win the prize, can we still attend the conference? I'll actually be kind of over there. So, Excellent. And yes, absolutely. You are all invited to attend the, the conference, um, even if you end up not applying for the campaign. Um, so the conference is November 16th through 19th in Rabat, Morocco. Um, we would love to have you all apply. Um, we're accepting applications right now. And the information is in the chat. Um, you can just go to www.mcc17.org um, and through there you can submit your application and feel free to also invite other friends to attend as well. Um, great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any, any final questions or Steve, do you have any final comments before we just quickly run through the, the deadlines? No, uh, I think, uh, you know, if you're on this call, this is a great start. Um, this is a great, a great place for you to learn about the prize. I think, um, I think you should rely on uh, team MCN here, um, to, to coach you through. I'll put some pressure on Amanda to say she will help you coach you through this. Um, <laughs> if you're thinking about applying, uh, we really look forward to it. I mean, I, if you can't tell, uh, I'm kind of into this stuff and, uh, and so are the other folks at, uh, at, uh, the Rimmer Family Foundation and, um, and, you know, a prize winner or not prize winner, we'd love to hear from you, love to be supportive. So, uh, so yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. So now I'll just turn it over to Amanda to share a little bit about the process from here till the conference. Um, I don't know if, are you on mute still or? Um, can you hear me? No, I don't think so. Here. Why don't you, here, I'm actually just going to give, I'll give you my computer since it seems like it's not working, okay. but you can still, you can still use, you keep sharing your screen. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll just start. Um, there are two ways to apply for the conference, and the first is through the conference application, which is at um, mcc17.org. Um, and this application is for students who um, may want to attend the conference that's in Rabat, um, which is November 16th through the 19th, um, and are also applying for the campaign. Um, and so that's where you'll apply for that. And the second way is through um, mcc17.org slash campaigns. Um, and this application is only for students who know that they um, cannot attend um, the conference in Rabat. Um, and so to go over some deadlines, um, the priority deadline is July 30th, um, and we encourage you to apply before this deadline. Um, applicants who apply before this date um, will, will have priority. Um, and um, so August 4th is when MCN will invite the first round of applicants um, who will move on to the second round. Um, and then August 18th is when we will begin our third round interviews, um, just to give you kind of an overview of our timeline. Um, and by September 17th, this is the final deadline. Um, and so we're gonna be accepting applications on a rolling basis before this date, um, but you're really strongly encouraged to apply before then. Um, and so on October 9th, um, we will select the top five applicants. And by mid-October, the winner will be selected. Um, and then November 16th through the 19th, again, um, the winner will need to be available during this date to either give a presentation in person or um, via webinar. So just keep that in mind when you're applying. Um, and again, any questions um, can be emailed to Raina at um, rfox at mcnpartners.org. So. so. <laughs> there you go. 
clearly we're next to each other. So great. Um, so thank you all so much for taking the time to call in. I'm sorry that we ran a little bit long, um, but we're really, really grateful to Steve and to our speakers for taking the time to speak with us. And we're so excited to see your applications. Already it's clear that you're doing an incredible work and you're thinking about things that we certainly wouldn't have been able to imagine. And that's really the goal of this campaign is to create space for people who are thinking creatively, who see challenges in the world that others don't see and are able to really rally peers around those challenges. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, if you're not sure if you want to apply or not because you're not really so confident, err on the side of apply. <laughs> um, we're really excited to work with you um, and to see what we can do together. So with that, I will wrap up this call, um, which will be available online for future viewing because we've been recording. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out and we look forward to seeing your application. So thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. All right, and I'm gonna end the meeting.